Hello and welcome to today's Kirklees Library's Writer in Residence session, which is part of the British Library's Unfinished Business, the Fight for Women's Rights exhibition. To find out more about it and other events happening, please visit this website, which is here, and that'll tell you what's on for the exhibition. We're joined today by our Writer in Residence, Christina Longdon, and Kirklees librarian Amanda and we will be talking about our favourite novels with strong female writers and characters. Christina will address the physical, emotional and psychological challenges facing women who engage in writing from working class backgrounds by reflecting on her own experiences. Okay so I'd like to introduce Christina to you now. Good morning. Hello. Chris. Hi there. <laughs> Hi. I'll hand over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Um, you made that sound really profound and, and like it's going to be an extremely intellectual talk, but I'll warn you all now it isn't because it's me. Um, without wanting to, to do myself down, which is the classic working class thing to do, just to say I am actually not normally that nervous about these sessions and talking on camera, but I really am about this one today. And I think that's because just looking into the psychological aspects of it here, because it means so much to me. It's it's very much the essence of who I am and, and who I was born and, and who I will probably go on to, to be. Um, so I'm going to start off really just by saying that I'm going to be chatting mainly about my own experience and my own thoughts, um, rather than giving you a lecture about the way that things are. So I'll talk a little bit about um, my background and then about my thoughts on my own, I guess, my my own experiences of, of prejudice really in a way without trying to have a big working class chip on my shoulder i'm trying to avoid that because it's very annoying when people do that 
So just to begin with, my notes are over here. So I'm not ignoring you on the camera. I'm just looking at my notes as I talk. So I'll chat a bit and then we'll come back to, to Nicola and to Amanda, who've also got some interesting stuff to talk about as well. So to begin with, I called this talk A Room of One's Own, I Wish, because I'm going to begin by talking about Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. And some of you might have read this, uh, many of you won't have done, and some of you might never want to read it. But I'll just summarise it now very briefly. It's basically a call to arms for the female writer. So it was written in the 1920s and Virginia Woolf set out an essay where she wanted to showcase just how difficult it was for women back then to be noticed as anything other than wives or mothers or as potential wives or mothers and certainly not as writers. And of course, you're probably familiar with the examples of George Eliot and the Brontes who had to write in fake names, basically, as men in order to be noticed in the publishing industry and to be taken seriously. And Virginia Woolf does actually mention Charlotte Bronte from round our way here in West Yorkshire. And she obviously talks to her and says what a fantastic writer she is. But she also says how much better she could have been if she wasn't obsessing and hampered by the domestic minutiae of life, such as needlework, for example. Now, you need to remember when she wrote this, this was a time when the vote for all women had only recently been achieved and women still very much lacked equality in law, in marriage, in property rights. And so she lays out the premise, really, that a woman, until a woman has an income of her own, until she has property of her own, as represented by a room of one's own, you can't really have independence and you can't really have equality. Um, and you certainly can't be creative unless you're doing needlework. So. This reminded me when I read this of something that my own mother-in-law once said to me just before I got married. And she's a, a Geordie woman from an extremely poor background. And she said to me, it really stuck in my head. When you get married, no matter how fantastic the person is that you get married to, it is so important for you to have financial independence and to always have your own bank account. And that's kind of the premise really of what Virginia Woolf is saying, which she's saying with regards to writing about don't lose your financial identity. If you need to have your independence, you also need your space. So she focuses on this privacy and this quiet and this area. And when I read um, her essay, it really did resonate with me. Uh, it's still very much an essay for today if you're a woman who wants to write. And I would recommend that you read it if you haven't already. But even on reading it, it was quite obvious to me. And again, this is, I suppose this is quite early on in, in growing in my confidence as a, as a female writer. It was quite obvious to me that it was very excluding of working class women. And if you think about it, her only experience of working class women would have been domestic servants and it would have been maybe potential recruits to the feminist movement. So her words and her advice I do feel are really not practical for working class women then and even today working class women now. But I don't want to knock it. Like I say, it's, it's a great it's a great thing to read. But I do want to use today's session to kind of explore um, some of the issues, some of the barriers that working class women who want to write have, have got to face, got to face with at the moment. Um, so if we can move on to these photographs that I've got for you that Nicola's going to um, click through and show you just just a little bit about my background, really. The first photograph here is my street. I still think of it as my street. This is a street I grew up on. This is a street um, that my parents still live on and it's in a town called Duckingfield. So I lived in the area of Duckingfield, Staler Bridge, which is on the east side of Manchester, um, Oldham, Ashton. You might have heard of the areas, a very northern town, a very an old mill town. And the next photograph, I must admit, I'm quite cute on that photograph there. I think I'm sticking my tongue out. The next photograph, this is my mum and my dad. And my dad, interestingly, has never been interested in books. Um, very literate person, but no interest in book, books whatsoever, unless he wants to delve in for a quick bit of information and, and get the hell out again. But my mum, the opposite. My mum's always been a complete bookworm from being born, I think. And she's still a bookworm now, even though it's a lot harder for all of us to kind of mentally focus to read during lockdown. So she was very much, I suppose, my inspiration to become obsessed with books. And she is still an incredibly intelligent woman. But the thing about my mum is, and I didn't know this until I was an adult, my mum didn't go to the local grammar school like you know a lot of the bright working class kids did because she deliberately failed her 11 plus on purpose, which still shocks me to this day. Um, and we were chatting about it yesterday, actually. And she did that because her parents couldn't afford the school uniform. So 
you know, in my mum's very stoical way, she would say, well, you know, I didn't particularly suffer too much because I went to the local comp and I was the head girl and I did, you know, did well out of that. And so my dad is, my dad's background, he is um, a HGB, a lorry mechanic, and my mum was a school secretary. First of all, the first job that she got on leaving school at 15, she went to work in the mills in Staler Bridge. And she had what I know some of the women considered to be a posh job because she worked in the office there. So again, we're talking about working classes, all these different stratas within the working class as well. And that's very much the, the background of my family. It's almost upper working class and then po poorer, lower working class combined, if you like. Um, so if we move on to the next picture, please. These, this is me and this is me and books and comics and magazines with my lovely pink NHS specs there which I loathed. I was quite a grumpy child unless I had access to books but I also think that very much something that I'm doing now with Kirkley is it's all about libraries. We could not afford to buy books. Most working class people then and still now could not afford to buy books um, and the libraries I completely relied on and I'm sure my mum relied on them as cheap babysitting as well because I spent half my life Life in the libraries after school during the school holidays the most wonderful places in the world as far as I'm concerned and, and ever more under threat they're places for the working classes where they are free you can stay as long as you want nobody hassles you you've got access to all this information that really isn't anywhere and certainly isn't on the internet um, they, they're gold mines but also kind helpful people who want to help you so I spent a lot of time there and I did end up going to university um, University, I was first generation university educated along with my brother. Nobody else had ever been before. And I absolutely hated it. I loathed it. My first year, my parents will tell you, I think I cried nonstop for, for my first year at university. And it was basically chronically homesick. And there was nobody around me that seemed to understand this other than a couple of other people who were from my same town who managed to get to university. And we were all just chronically homesick together. And I think rather than maybe calling it homesickness, it was more of a fish out of a water experience surrounded by middle class kids who seem to be so confident so independent and absolutely used to living away from home and doing what they wanted and, and I was just a wreck um, but I was very lucky because I did end up having a wonderful professor who was actually an expert on working class history I was studying history and he knew he sensed that I was dropping out and he could see my confidence I think going during seminars and tutorials and he gave me good talking to um, he was a professor called Professor Cal Chin and he's an expert on the Peaky Blinders. That's a bit of a teaser for, for a session I'm doing in a few weeks' time. But yeah, he kind of saved my university career, if you like, and, and persuaded me to stay on. Um, so I went into a career that was nothing at all to do with writing, other than I was able, I suppose, to hone um, my, my writing abilities in, in that career. So I ended up in social housing. And then strangely, I ended up going to live in Namibia, which is in Southern Africa. And I was working, again, another career that I had no intention of doing, nothing to do with writing. But when I was there, somebody noticed in the charity that I was working for that I was good at writing. So they asked me, would I like to work with the Kalahari Bushmen, who were the indigenous people that we were living with and working with at the time, and to put their words into a book format. And that was the first time ever I got the chance really to write a book. And I wrote another one. And it was just, you know, when you feel like, wow, this is this is what I'm meant to do. And it was such a privilege to to give voice to people who, who would just, you know, they are the lowest at the low, the most oppressed people in the world who have no voice whatsoever and to help them to do that. So when I came back to live in England after a few years, I decided I was going to write my own books. So, Nicola, can we have the next slide? You can have a, a little look at um up in the top left hand corner there that's the book that I did with the sun uh, the Kalahari and then I wrote Mind Games and Ministers and Cuckoo and the Chocolate which were basically my stories of my experiences working in social housing with a, a crazy comedy drama if you like but some politics thrown into it um, so I published those and then my family had had a very very strange experience in that my dad had discovered that our great 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 granddad had converted to Islam. He was one of the first British converts to Islam, and his name was Robert Rashid Stanley. And my family and friends kept nudging me to write this. So I did a lot of research with a couple of other family members who were fantastic on family history research, and I turned that into a book called His Own Man. Um, the twist of the tale is that my brother 
had also converted to Islam a um, hundred years afterwards. None of us knew anything about our great great granddad, who had completely had his history eradicated by our family. Kind of embarrassed, not wanting to talk about this man who'd done this unusual thing, but history repeats itself. And so th those were really the, the books that um, were my writing. All, all came out those are my most recent books really but going back to the Robert Rashid Stanley two books there his own man and imagining Robert okay he's a man so people will know about him more than they would do a woman but he's from the working classes so it was incredibly hard to get some good research materials on him he was invisible basically I had to do a lot of scouring around for him because the working classes didn't leave generally speaking written records during Victorian times of themselves uh, until the World War II really when, when they became more of a trend perhaps to keep diaries in your family to keep them Writing materials cost money, you didn't have time, you would be in your job, you wouldn't have the energy at the end of the day. And it was seen as incredibly self-indulgent to start writing about yourself. I mean, who, who cares about you? Who's gonna ever read the stuff that you've written? So how much more so for the women in his life, for his wife and his daughters and his sisters and his mother, nothing on them whatsoever. So because of that, even though I could do the historical research on his life, I decided I was going to be, get a bit creative and get a bit imaginative and imagine these women in his life which is what imagining Robert is really a product of my imagination of of him and the women around him and the lives that were hidden so just to say as well whilst we're talking about Robert Rashid in particular one of the things that I discovered in this research was we might have this idea that they're working classes because they don't get to go to grammar school or they don't get to go to private school they're really a bunch of elaborate you know illiterate thickies but that was a thing that really astonished me until the 1870s when kids had to go to school by law there was actually a massive movement for the self-education of the working classes and this is where you'll have heard of the working men's institutes come into it um, a fierce tradition of, of self-taught learning in particularly in, in the north of England where I'm from and women could be members of the institutes and they could have access to the lessons and to the lectures and to the newspapers and to the books because they were private subscription libraries before the public libraries came into being. So I would argue that even though there's very little evidence of the women in my family in particular being very literate, that they were very literate, even if it was only auditory, even if it was only listening to debates and the discussions that were happen, happen, that were going on at that time. They did lack the tools of, of getting time away from children because either these women had 10 to 15 pregnancies, which, which was the average during these days, um, or they were down the mill all the time working or looking after other people's children. So there wasn't the time to sit and read and certainly not to write. There wasn't the space, you know, in, in the mill times, everybody was in, in crowded conditions and there certainly wasn't the energy. There were none of the household saving tasks that we've all been born and bred into. And of course, this was a patriarchal society, you know, for a working class woman to suddenly sit down and say, I'm going to write my diary. It wouldn't really have been the done thing. But times have changed, haven't they? Now we're all liberated. We've got greater rights. We've got more acknowledgements. We've got more chances to achieve whatever we want in our chosen careers. There's more women in Parliament than ever before. There's more women writers than ever before who are getting published. But the women writers that are getting published in the main are not socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so I kind of knew that in my gut, but when I started doing a bit of research for this talk, I was really shocked. It is so difficult to find a list of working class women writers who have made it, who people know about. Um, so I'm going to chat a little bit about that now, about these are my perceptions of why it is still so difficult for that to happen. And the first thing, uh, and speaking from my own experience here, trying to get noticed in the publishing world, a lot of it is... Is, is, whether, is this familiar territory for you? Have you ever met a writer in your life? I certainly haven't growing up. Um, and it's, it's about community experience. Do you know any writers? Do you know anybody who has a career in the arts? If you're working class, probably not. I was lucky on our street, there were a couple of artsy people who, who kind of opened my eyes, I guess, to what you could do with your life. Because um, for me, it's always, already been this progression of get yourself a good pension I think from the age of 10 I was thinking I must get a good pension because the state won't look after me in my old age not to the degree I need them to so the other thing is as well subconsciously and I do this myself as a parent and I don't mean to but subconsciously we do put our fears onto our children and very much our fears for the economic future of our children so for example even if our parents never said to me out loud oh don't go into writing 
there was always this thing of a risky career, a bit like acting, like the arts, you know, sounds lovely, but, but you know, maybe not practical. And I guess those are the vibes that you pick up in a community if you don't already know somebody that is happily carrying on as a writer, or as an artist. But there's also um, running with the pack as well. And this um, sense of you mustn't leave the pack. You mustn't be different. You're a bit weird if you sit there writing. You're a bit of an oddball. You're a bit eccentric. Um, so there's that familiarity with you've got to stay with your group. And again, you know, it's not a particularly nice thing to say. But then when you do get a group of, of particularly oppressed people, for whatever reasons, if you dare to sort of venture outside of the pack, you can be the first to be attacked with who do you think you are getting above yourself? you know full of it and there is this this I mean I've experienced this a lot myself you know if you if you do go out there public and you do talk about things you almost there are people that just want to stab you in the back and bash you overhead and say get back into your box but on top of that as well there is this association if you're very proud of, of being working class there's almost this sense of well I, I don't want I like I like my people I like where I'm from I don't want to become part of this middle class people um and again, like I said earlier, you know, this this sense of writing is so up itself. It's so self-indulgent, you know, so navel gazing. Why would you do that? It's not going to change anybody's life. Do something practical. Time is the other big one as well. And, and I think most women listening to this who, who are looking after people and who are carers, whether it's children, whether it whether it's elders, time is is you need time to write and I think one of the great things actually about lockdown is mentally a lot of people who are writers have, have struggled with trying to find those stretches of time even if you have them more than ever mentally you're not quite there so this this is a great thing about social media you can play around and mess around and you're still shaping your writing in silly ways or in serious ways but those long stretches of time needed for writing a book for example just really not available to your average working class woman because when you're looking after kids there's no time and then when your kids leave home you think oh, okay maybe i'll write my book now oh now i've got to look after my parents and and most people from working class background were very familiar with that sort of story. Um, further education, a big issue for me. I was really lucky because I was from a time when there were these things called grants. So I managed to get to university. I'm pretty sure it would have been a lot harder for me if the grant system hadn't been available. I'm from a family where we don't trust credit, we don't trust credit cards, we don't trust loans. It's quite, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but working class families are very anti taking out loans. I know that isn't what perhaps the media tells you, but there is this sense of don't take on what you can't afford. Um, so that was something that hampered me, I guess, but it, but it would also very much hamper somebody else. Actually going to university and learning how to write is, is very, very costly. And there's all kinds of arguments for and against that. But then again, if you don't go to university and you don't move out of your social circle, you are not going to meet people who have access to the publishing industry, who, who could help you to improve your writing. So that keeps you kind of back where you came from. Confidence is the other big one as well. So I'm sure I come across as being very confident, but uh, that's why I thought it was quite important at the beginning to say, I'm actually not confident in everything and certainly not talking about personal things that are of huge importance to me. That's when the nerves begin. And I think it's probably because if you're working class, generally speaking, you have no sense of entitlement. Um, you, you were riddled with self-doubt anyway, so it doesn't help when people are saying to you, who do you think you are? I'll get you with your writing. Um, and there is this thing that, you know, the flavour of the month word is imposter syndrome. So that is massive if you're from a working class background. And you have insecurity, you have this kind of, ooh, you go to pieces if you make a mistake. You, you're just not solid in your, in your sense of entitlement. So just to give you an example, pronunciation of words. Um, I'm actually not too bad at pronouncing foreign words when, I, when I'm doing a talk like this, but there's often a lot of words that I'm familiar with through reading because I'm an avid reader, but because I ha perhaps haven't had as much um, embedding, if you like, in conversations using words and concepts that somebody else from a more privileged background might have had, I feel really self-conscious about that, like I'm going to look like a thick old idiot because I don't know how to pronounce this particular word. Um, I don't think people notice that. I think it's just more of a more of an internal um, issue that I have with with my own confidence 
something else as well not all working class people might agree with me on this but i do think there is a massive fear of rejection it isn't confined to working class writers i know it isn't but i think you perhaps feel it a little bit more if you're from a background where you never really expected to get on or to do well or to be successful in in the world of the arts um and that fear of rejection is bad enough for anyone but how much more so if you've never particularly felt that you were ever going to amount to anything anyway um that's quite sad i know but the flip side of that is i have found as well that that um from my own perspective but also from other people from the working classes that i know who've gone into writing there is a sense of pride that is massive uh, and almost a sense of well you know if they're not going to help me i'll do it myself and that's actually quite a positive thing it's kind of what i did for myself um, in terms of not sitting around waiting to be noticed you know what i love this i love who i am going to do this i'm going to crack on and do it whatever i don't really care whether you are impressed by it or not i've got a sense of pride in the quality of my work and and i'd like to see more working class people doing that rather than sitting around kind of begging for the scraps from the publishing table sorry publishers if there's any publishers watching but there is that sense of pride real pride and um you know when you've worked hard to do something it, i'm just going to get on and do it myself and the big thing the number one thing for a lot of working class kids who want to go into writing as soon as you learn how little money you will earn it's a big off putter. Um, the average income for a, a writer who writes full time is eleven and a half thousand pounds a year, which is five thousand pounds below the level of income accepted to be a socially acceptable standard of living. Pretty bad. So even more so, which hopefully will come on later when we get some questions. If you're from a black and minority ethnic background, or if you're a woman who's disabled, for example, and I've got a great quote here from um, a Welsh. Muslim Pakistani woman um, called Dura Shawa Mupal, who gives her experiences of being a working class writer. My first hand experiences of the sense of lacking and feelings of being an outsider that can occur when in a predominantly middle class environment come from work. My feelings of being pleased about landing a job, loosely related to my two degrees, soon turned into feelings of disillusionment as I became more conscious of the way that my tongue did not roll around the vowels and pronounce all the T's due to growing up in a rough neighbourhood, as well as being bilingually fluent in English and Urdu both. It soon became distressing trying to smooth out my words, especially since I hardly came across others who spoke the way I did in the industry. I also became more aware of my lack of knowledge and familiarity with things like literature exhibitions, festivals, galleries, or even cultural references. Things that other people may think common knowledge are things that I still find myself shaking my head at, not knowing and constantly asking questions about. Much of it is also to do with embodying two cultures and two languages as a Pakistani born Welsh Muslim, as well as being working class, which makes me feel like I lag behind on all fronts. She nailed it for me there because that's exactly how I think I felt at university. I, I just lacked this, this experience of this lit this. I suppose just exposure to different ideas, different writers, and it's very easy to lose your confidence when your confidence is already quite brittle, when you're surrounded by people who've just been born and bred with this educational knowledge. Um, I've got another question, uh, another quote here rather from Kit Duval, who is a fantastic writer with a working class background. I'm sure many of you have heard of her, and if not, you need to go and read her stuff. My name is Leon. Um, so this is something that, that Kit says. This is when she kind of realised, I am working class and I am other. We need to be invited to this party. That invitation comes from the experience of seeing ourselves included, knowing that writing by us and about us and for us has a place at the table. I remember watching the BBC weather as a teenager and after the presenter had covered the cold in Lancashire and the rain in Kent, he smiled and pointed at Switzerland. At least we'll have some snow on the slopes for half term, he said, and went on to give the skiing forecast. No one I knew had ever been skiing. Skiing was for posh people. I'm not included, I thought. He wasn't talking to me any more than Evelyn Waugh was talking to me when he spoke of grand country houses and Oxford's cloistral hush. Even Jane Eyre, a poor orphan, was well educated, spoke French and played the piano, ultimately and conveniently becoming a rich heiress. Who would I have been had I lived at Thornfield Hall with Mr Rochester, the housekeeper? More likely, I would have been Leah, the maid of whom we are given few details and no sense of her life and passions. 
or whether Charlotte Bronte considered her, like Jane, a free human being with an independent will. So I'll leave it there for now because I've talked enough and I shall hand over to Nicola and to Amanda who are going to talk a little bit about their own favourite strong female characters in books. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks Chris, lovely. Okay I'll, I'll introduce you to Amanda now, I'll pass you over to, to her. <laughs> oh hi good morning everybody yeah and uh, thanks to, to Chris and to Nicola for inviting me to be um, a part of this session this morning um, a really interesting um, beginning and introduction there by by Christina thank you um, I think a lot of what, what you said Chris really resonated with me as well um, especially the bit about the working class has been loath um, to take out loans because I know that was definitely the mantra in uh, my home when I was growing up it was uh, if you can't afford it you can't have it um, but I kind of like to think that that's given me a, a sensible attitude to, to money as I've uh, as I've grown up. So yeah. Anyway, um, as part of the session this this morning, um, Christina asked us to um, have a think about. Um, some books that we'd enjoyed um, by working class female writers. Um, so I kind of went away and, and had a look at my bookshelf and, and had a think about um, some of the books that, that I'd read that, that fit that category. Uh, and actually, uh, I found it uh, quite difficult uh, to come up with some titles, which is obviously quite quite telling. And I guess um, one, one of the points that, that we're making in, in this session this morning. Um, but I did come up with uh, a list here. Um, so some of the, the books on here are books that I have read and enjoyed. Um, and then there are one or two others that I, I haven't read, but are definitely on um, my to read list. Uh, so I don't know, I'll, I'll just do a, a quick uh, guide through them. And hopefully there might be someone there that, that you've read. Uh, if not, there might be something there to pique your interest and you might go away and, and read it for yourself. Uh, so the first one on there, Carmen Marcus, um, How Saints Die. Uh, th this is one that I, I haven't read, but does sound interesting. Carmen um, grew up in a, a council estate in the northeast in the 1980s. I think she was the daughter um, of a fisherman. And th this is just um, a semi-autobiographical um, story um, about her life and her, her sort of upbringing. So that, that sounds really good. Uh, and then the next one, Clash by Ellen Wilkinson. Um, again, this, this is one that I haven't read, but another one that sounds interesting and, and probably the one on here that, that's the, the most, um, the earliest published. Um, Ellen Wilkinson was born in the 1890s into a, a, a really, really poor family, um, but actually a, a very ambitious family. Um, and she kind of worked her way up the, the social ladder and ended up becoming an MP um, for, for Jarrow. But th this book, um, Clash, um, again, it's kind of semi-autobiographical. Uh, it's set against the, the backdrop of the uh, 1926 um, general strike um, and sort of follows the, the fortunes of, of one of the characters through there. Um, so the next one on the list is um, Lowborn by Kerry Hudson. Now, this, this is at the top of my to-read list. It's been on my radar for a, a while, really, and I really, really want to um, read this. Um, so uh, Kerry Hudson um, was, was born in Aberdeen, um, in, again, into, um, well, poverty, really. Um, she attended nine primary schools and five secondary schools because um, she, she kept sort of moving around with, with her mum. She lived in sort of bed and breakfasts um, and council flats. Um, so th this book, Lowborn, really, it's an exploration of, um, of where she, she came from. Um, and she visits the towns uh, that, sh that she grew up in um, just to sort of try and discover what being poor um, really means in Britain today and, and whether things have, have changed. Um, so I think, I think that actually sounds like a, a really, really interesting read. So I'm going to try and get my hands on that as soon as I can and have a read of that. Um, coming down to the bottom row, I've put on there Livy Michael, um, Under a, a Thin Moon. Um, again, th this is another one that I haven't read, but it, it does sound um, really interesting. Uh, again, L Livy Michael, born into a, an a extreme um, life of, of poverty, um, had a, a, a very um, difficult upbringing. Um, and the 
the book Under a Thin Moon, it's um, about uh, four women living on a Greater Manchester council estate, um, sort of unemployed, um, isolated, living in poverty, and again, just sort of follows their their stories. Uh, that that does get uh, very excellent reviews. Um, so yeah, another one that I'd, I'm interested in reading. Um, the next one, Home by Amanda Berryman. Um, this this is one that I have read um, and enjoyed. I read it I read it quite some time ago actually, but it, it's just one of those books that that kind of sticks with you. And even though I can't remember all the exact details of of the story, um, uh, I do just sort of remember you know the the general theme of it and remember being really caught up in it and, and enjoying it. And it is one that I would I would definitely. Um, recommend um, to people to read. Um, again, Amanda Berryman, the author, um, grew up in a, a single parent family. Um, her dad was absent. Um, the family, you know, had lots of financial struggles. Um, and I think she's she's kind of drawn on this experience for for this this book. Um, the main character in the book is is Jessica. She's um, four and a half years old, um, and she lives in a, a flat with her mum and her baby brother Toby uh, and unfortunately the landlord is trying to evict them uh, from the flat. Um, the story's quite harrowing, baby brother's got a, a cough um, and that just um, gets worse throughout the story but unfortunately that's that's not the worst of the things that, that happen to the family. Uh, I mean obviously I won't, I won't say too much, I don't want to spoil it uh, for anybody, but again, if, if if somebody is interested in reading books by you know working class female writers, I can definitely recommend Home. And then the last one on the list, again, another one that that I have read and enjoyed um, by the author Caitlin Moran. This is How to Build a Girl. Um, so for anybody that's that's aware of of this author, um, again, she was born into a, a, a working class background, lived in Brighton, had seven siblings, um, and and sort of brought up in a in a county house and this um, uh, story is it's set in the 1990s and again it's a semi-autobiographical work uh, and it's about a young girl um, just sort of trying to escape um, really the, the life that, that she's living brought up in the 1990s family on benefits and just about her, her sort of hopes and, and dreams that she has for her future. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that's my list of um, books by working class female writers, like I say, some of which I've read and enjoyed and some of which are definitely um, on my to read list. Um, and then before I finished, I just wanted to mention um, this lady as well, um, Sheila Delaney and her play, um, A Taste of Honey. Because um, uh, a few years ago, well, quite about 20 years ago, really, I went through um, a bit of a, a kind of social realism stage and I was really into sort of um, watching all the, you know, 1950s sort of kitchen sink dramas, uh, like Look Back in Anger, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning and uh, um, A Kind of Loving. Um, and also... Um, one of the the um, important um, things which came out around this time was the play A Taste of Honey, written by Sheila Delaney. So it was written in the the fifties, and and Sheila was was born into a a working class family in Salford. Um, she left school at fifteen, but she knew that she really really wanted to be a writer. So she ended up um, writing this play, A Taste of, of Honey, um, and, it, and it just became a, a massive hit at the time and is obviously still, um, you know, very well regarded today. She was she was really just determined to get sort of working class life and, and language on the stage. Um, and again, a bit a bit sort of like the point that Chris raised in, in, a, in a world sort of dominated by men, really, she, she you know, she she managed to do that and got wrote this play a taste of honey and, and got it out there and got it on the stage to to great aplomb so yeah good stuff <laughs> oh thanks amanda yeah there's there's uh, definitely loads of books there that i'd love to get reading yeah <laughs> okay thanks um okay i'll just put a slide on for mine as well so um when i was thinking of strong female characters and writers um, the first person that sprang to mind was um, Elizabeth Gaskell, and she wrote Mary Barton in 1848. And I remember studying this and reading it at a young age, 
and it must have made a really big impression on me because the the fact that she could offer such a detailed portrait of the lives of the very poor in Victorian society and that she was wanting to show the living conditions and to bring alive the sort of teeming slums of manufacturing in in Manchester. Um, She was obviously deeply affected by the poverty uh, that she witnessed and her depth of feeling is is really evident in it and the book just really moved me and and I remember reading that uh, vividly really. Um, And then also uh, Louisa May Alcott um, is another that stands out for me really because she wrote Little Women in 1868-69 and it created a realistic picture of family life with the family sometimes living in troubled times Um, and it was based on Alcott's own uh, childhood about a family of modest means but with an optimistic outlook and in one part she, she quotes paid up all the debts thank the lord so I think I could relate to this book as I was one of three sisters, like the four female siblings in the book, and I could relate to the trials and tribulations of sisterhood. <laughs> um, another that um, is the Bronte sisters for me as well. Um, there were three sisters born in the village of Fountain, and then later they lived in the village of Haworth. They originally published their poems and novels under male pseudonyms, Curra, Ellis and Acton Bell. Emily Bronte only wrote one book in 1847, Wuthering Heights, but it's my all-time favourite, and the work covers three generations isolated in the cold, in the rambling, dilapidated pile of Wuthering Heights. And I suppose I could relate again to the three sisters growing up on the Yorkshire Moors and sort of loving the beauty of of the Moors and everything, um, as I had with my sisters. Um, and then the other book that I've um, sh- shown on the slide is uh, Common People by Kit Dewal. Um, and it's an anthology of working class writers. And this is available on our ebooks um, Overdrive um, collection. And in Kit's own words, it's a collection of 17 excellent memoirs by brilliant new writers whose lives demonstrate such resilience humour, solidarity, solidarity and courage. Okay, so that's that. And then I wanted to just share with you as well this, this book as well, which is Suffragette, The Battle for Equality, and it's by David Roberts. Um, and I really love this book. I've read it with my daughter lots of times. Um, and it just brings home the struggles that for women's suffragettes went through in their battle for equality. Um, and it shows sort of indiv- individual acts of bravery and strength and, and covers the whole of the suffragette um, experiences uh, from aristocrats to the middle and working class um, and sort of the overall struggle for suffrage. So, yeah, I definitely recommend that one as well. Um, OK. Um, right. So I'm just going to bring Chris back here because we've had some comments. Uh, come through on YouTube. So um, there we go. So uh, we've got uh, my granddad used to say, don't buy anything unless you can afford it twice. <laughs> okay. Bang on. <laughs> Bang on, Lucy. <laughs> um, and then Amira says, I can relate to what you said in relation to my daughter who did music. Which is not gen- which is generally not a working class domain. She was probably the only working class kid in many of the orchestras. Okay. Yeah, I know that feeling. I played a yeah. flute, and it was just so embarrassing. <laughs> it was really hard. Yeah, and yeah. I think a lot of working class kids give up because you, again, you just feel you're so different to everybody else, and you're so fish out of the water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we got Susan says, fantastic talk, Chris. Oh, thanks, Susan. <laughs> oh, you put, you put on there, haven't you? Yes, I was hideous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, oh, again, okay, we've got another one. Oh, Christina, I think what you were saying about feeling other in the field can be the greatest barrier. 
yeah and again that comes from this this lack of confidence of you're just as good if not better than everybody else which is <laughs> what my professor told me at university which you know i'm sure it was a lot of rubbish but it really helped me and i think sometimes that's all you need isn't it you just need somebody who notices somebody's confidence confidence is just going and and just you know picking them up a little bit um people like that are just real life angels i think <laughs> Okay, I'll bring Amanda on as well to join us. So I think we've got some more questions. Oh, I've got to, I've got to do my next slides, Nicola. Sorry. Um, yep. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm racing yep. on ahead. She's, right, she's just so eager yeah. To, yeah. to get to the questions. Uh, no, that, that's great because you've shared the books that you feel really passionate about. Um, and it's funny because some of them are obviously the same as the ones that, that I've kind of feel strongly about as well. So if you just, if I'll, we'll just whiz through this really fast. These are the ones that um, I grew up with. Um, and Nicola's got a slide here to show you. These, there's, there's four books, well, there's four authors in particular, working class authors that, that were part of my childhood and, and really inspired me. Um, and the first one is, I think Nicola's got a slide here, but I'll tell you the first one before she brings the slide up. It's Sue Townsend, who wrote the Adrian Moore books. Um, absolutely love Adrian Moore, uh, I still do. You can see there the second book along, um, both my kids love Adrian Moore. And I think it was the first time ever I'd read about people with family. I mean, obviously, clearly my family life is not as dysfunctional. Um, as Adrian Moles was, is um, just a lovely tale of a kid who was clearly working class and lacked, I suppose, that background and that confidence and he wanted to be an intellectual um, and just a lovely story and I'd recommend to anybody that's got kids to get them to read this when they're that bit older, it's fantastic. Um, Catherine Cookson, I never read, but the reason I'm, I'm mentioning Catherine Cookson is because obviously working class background writer, um, phenomenally commercially successful, but people looked down their nose at Catherine Cookson because she was phenomenally commercially successful and very much liked by working class women because she wrote about working class women. Um, and again, that's one of the things I really struggle with in the, the world of the, the literary love is, is, there is there is such snobbery about fantastic writing that is pitched particularly at, at working class women. So that's why I invite, um, I've included Catherine Cookson. That also, that book there, I bought that for my mum. I think I was 10 and I bought that for her. She probably won't remember that. But Pat Barker, a, again, um, a fantastic writer um, who has great um, literary acclamation. And uh, you've got to read the Regeneration trilogy. So I won't give you any spoilers. But if you've not read Pat Barker, my God, this is movie and harsh stuff about World War One. Jeanette Winterson absolutely love i think i've read most of her books um many of you will be familiar with oranges are not the only fruit because there was a tv series way back in the day that was really the one that she kind of first burst um onto onto the screens um with um and very much kind of a, a tale of her childhood um fantastic and if you can read her autobiography as well because that's brilliant okay next slide moving on swiftly these are some ones that I haven't necessarily read, but that are on my list. Boy at the back of the class down there at the bottom is a fantastic one for kids. We might discuss in a minute about um, if you are not born in the British Isles or if you are second or third generation from a group of people who are immigrants or refugees, that is that says it all really about what it's like to arrive in a country um where you are suddenly just the lowest of the low and a very good book for kids but there's some great ones on there know your place is another anthology which i've just read the, the kit deval uh, quote from noughts and Clossers, Mal mallory blackburn blackman another working class writer um jill dawson louise doty um and sitting ducks by lisa blower which again is quite a well-known one now these are all stuff that i would um want to read myself if i haven't already read and someone just told me about Bess, um, a novel by Rose Thomas, which is really um, um, an, an older woman. I'm not exactly how sure how old she was when she wrote this very recently. I think she might have been in her 60s, um, a, a Jamaican woman who is from uh, the Liverpool area. And yeah, yeah, it's great. I think being being um, a woman is as you get older, you perhaps do get a little bit more confidence in yourself and you wish that you'd done things um, a bit different way back when. But now it is a lot easier to be an older woman and to take up the pen and to start writing. And I'm sure some of the women in, in the writing groups that I'm involved with might agree with me on that. Um, it isn't all downhill as you get older by any means when it comes to writing. Um, next slide, please, Nicola. 
You see, we mentioned a taste of funny, but there it is. I just wanted quickly to end the slides with, um, I think one of the things that we forget when we talk about women and writing, you automatically think books, novels. And actually, there are some fantastic women playwrights and some fantastic women screenwriters. I mean, the obvious ones straight away, uh, Caroline Ahern, which many of you will remember, a fantastic comedy writer. Victoria Wood, a working class background again. Um, just one of my all time favourites, um, Kay Meller, Sally Wainwright. Everybody knows Sally Wainwright again. You know, these are women who who may not themselves say that they're from a working class background. Again, a lot of that to do with how you self-identify, but who write the most fantastic working class stories based very much on women. Um, Deb McAndrew, who is, is a, a fantastic writer, and Nusat Ali as well, who, who did When George Came to Bradford, is, is a bit of an up and coming. Um, I've got some more up and comings there that have slipped beneath um, the black teeth and a brilliant smile, which is by Adele Stripe. Now, Adele wrote this wonderful book, about Andrea Dunbar, who wrote Grisha Sue and Bob Two, and who unfortunately died very young. But that's a great story. If you want to read about a working class woman and the genuine struggles that, that people who are extremely poor have if they want to take up writing, but then achieve fantastic success, as Andrea did, do have a look at Adele's book. Um, so thank you. That's the end of my slides. That's the end of my little shares for you. I think we're going to go to some questions if we've got any. Okay, um, let's okay. All right, was that one first? Right then, there we go. Uh, when was your first awareness that you were working class? Um, it wasn't when I was at school. I think, I think it probably was when I went. Yeah, it was when I went to university. But I still wouldn't like I said. I spent the whole first year feeling homesick, and I was thinking, oh, that's because I'm really close to my parents. Um, but I think that's what it was. I think it was this this sense of, oh, I am re really out of my depth here. Not academically, because you know I, I can swat and I can, I can read and I can write and I can do very well. But but absolutely, just on a different <laughs> different planet to everybody else who didn't feel the same feelings that I had towards home and towards my hometown. But yeah, I would say it was at university. And thankfully, I started learning about working class people in history, um, you know, I guess as a species and as a specimen. But also I had a, a tutor I've mentioned before who was able to draw me into it. And, and he would say things to me like, right, just just tell them how to pronounce that word there. And I got it's Salford. It's not Salford. <laughs> so it was nice to feel actually my knowledge was was quite you know quite important to the study of history <laughs> okay uh now we've got another it's been working class set in stone well this is a massive discussion and, and you know i could have done an entire talk on, on this i mean it's a really potentially confusing time to be talking about class at this, at this particular moment in history i mean traditionally you, you put an economic measure on it don't you you, you sort of look at was is working class, it's someone who's born into a poorer area, it's someone who attended a state school, it's someone whose parents had manual jobs, they didn't go to university, or they might be like me, first generation educa um, educated at university. And there's the social and the cultural aspects as well. Um, the BBC recently did this big survey and they said that there were seven social classes. Um, and it has become more blurred. And there's this whole issue of, OK, so you're born working class and you end up in a job like this, maybe as a writer, even though you earn less than everybody else, um, then you are no longer working class. But I would say it's very much it's a self-identification thing and it's who you feel the most comfortable with. And it's where you've come from in the beginning. But it's not necessarily whether you meet all those bum, bum, bum economic targets that I think people put on it a lot of it you know to do with the way that you talk the way that you, you carry yourself again the people you choose to surround yourself with and the value system um it, it's your people I think at the end of the day but again that's that's harder to quantify and I think um one of one of the things that is quite interesting when we're talking about class and women in literature is if you look at for example some of the women from a black and minority ethnic background if you if you traced I guess what their economic background is particularly if they came from overseas and came to live in this country a lot of them you would say well actually um you don't qualify for being working class and, and I just that drives me crazy because it, it just doesn't work like that in Britain I've got a great quote here actually from um Humira Khan who is was contacted to me earlier who's a fantastic um activist for um for women Muslims uh women Muslim women and uh, she's based 
down south, but we won't hold that against her. <laughs> she just said, she said this and this sort of nails it for me. I just wanted to make a point about minority women in particular who are not working class. As an example, my family are North Indian in origin and Pakistani after partition. Historically, they are urban people, not rich or landowners, but comfortable at an average level. On coming to the UK, our family becomes working class and follow a similar London migration story starting from Whitechapel to now Wembley. I do think there is a difference in understanding social class from an Eastern and Western perspective. Class in a European sense is rooted both in the feudal system and the industrial revolution. The feudal system was introduced in the subcontinent with the British and continues to be a problem today. So I think that that's something to always be mindful as well. Having worked with a lot of people from refugee backgrounds who may have been middle class, even upper class overseas in terms of the jobs and their education, you come to England, just completely different. You're treated completely different. And it's a lot for a lot of me, it's about affinity and about solidarity with the people that you surround yourself with. Sorry, that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> I think Commander's got some questions now. So there we go. Is that yeah oh yeah so another question that we have chris is um what about people who aren't working class but write working class books because you mentioned that, that did, you mentioned that didn't you you know i found exactly the same you know i've read stuff and i know chatting to my mum as well you know you read something by a writer and it's just so your story who you are and where you're from and then you go and find out about them and they live in a mansion and you're what uh, and i think the, the thing is 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 being a writer is about imagination uh, i think the first time i ever noticed how fantastic writers can be in terms of getting inside somebody's head else's head is when roddy doyle who is a man mm. wrote um, the woman who walked into doors and i couldn't believe that a man could have written about through a woman's perspective so well um willie russell fantastic you know i love educating rita i love shirley valentine and you know telling the story of working class women really well even though he's not a woman um i think the brontes is always a good example because i do know people who, who talk about the brontes as some kind of a religious cult um who sort of say but do you know what at the end of the day they were privileged okay they might have not been posh or well-off privileged but they lived in a parsonage they had servants they were nothing like the average woman in haworth in the domestic industry working in the mills they really weren't um and and i think that's kind of sad if you have that perspective that you automatically exclude somebody because they have a slightly different better sense of you know um an economic um status at that time um they had it rough they didn't have it as rough as but you know this isn't a competition this is about stories that appeal to women and that are from women's struggles whether you sit there with your needlework and you're not allowed to go out and, and talk to men in the street like the working class women are doesn't matter to me. The, the thing that I have often thought about Wuthering Heights being my favourite as well, Nicola, um, is the heroine, Cathy, and the hero, at Heathcliff. They are actually thinking more and more about this. They're not to me. It's Nellie Dean. Nellie Dean is telling the story. And if you if you look into what she says, you read that book with a different challenge to go and read that book with a different set of, of eyes on it. She's telling a story from the servant's perspective. And there are bits in it that she conceals from the hero and the heroine. Uh, and there are bits where she's actually quite manipulative. And I think this is the bit that I'm, I'm always very interested in is women who don't have power what, for whatever reasons, whether it's a cultural issue or whether it's a class issue. If you if you do not have true equality in a relationship, you take back that power. And it's often in a manipulative or a secretive way, but you make sure you find that power that you have. And it's not always a nice way either. But I think that's what I like about Nellie Dean. You know, it's it's almost like Emily Bronte put a coded signal there, a message in there for us, which is actually, don't look at Cathy and Heathcliff, look at what's going on here with the lower orders and look at how, even if you're not writing that story, you're playing in it to a quite a large degree. She brought Hareton up, you know, she brought up this child and then had to, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, you had to go at the age of, it was taken away from her, but, but she mentions that. There's no huge big hoo-ha, there's no chapters about the grief that Nellie Dean went through. So when I was looking about this, because that was my theory, I found out that there's actually a book written called Nellie Dean, which is in Kirkley's Library's Overdrive a collection and it's it's basically I guess you might call it fan fiction but it's written it's it's Nellie Dean's story through her eyes 
um, and it's written by a woman who is sort of really a bit like I am, I suppose, to into the Victorian um, stories stories of women. So, yeah, that that was that was something that I felt quite strongly about, which is, you know, yes, authentic, authentic working class women writers from a certain background, absolutely, but but don't start throwing the baby out with the bathwater because there are people that tell our stories very well as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this one more. There we go. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so yes, yes, have I experienced prejudice as a working class writer? Definitely, as a working class person, probably more so, to be honest. Um, I remember once I went for a job interview and I didn't find out till a bit later, I got the job, but that the person who owned the company said about me afterwards, Oh, fantastic, be really good, really great, you know, wonderful person to appoint, but God, that awful accent is that put on or what for effect? And I was so offended when I heard this because what happens with me is when I'm nervous, I one talk fast, but my accent also gets really broad as well. So you can imagine in a job interview, <laughs> but you know, just, just little things like that, and the way that, and often you don't find out do you at the time until much later how people perceive you um writing it's a lot more transparent how people perceive you and um i have had a couple of things said to me which is about absolutely love this book um and our reader panel loved it as well but it's a bit too northern and a little bit too working class can you make it appeal more to chardonnay swinging women in the south <laughs> which is my worst nightmare but, but yeah um yeah but a lot of the prejudice like anything you you don't notice it because it's quite invisible and again you know we keep giving ourselves these headlines like women have independence women achieve this um and actually when, when you sort of look at what's lurking behind the doors um you, you realize there are still there are still so many barriers out there and i think that's this is what's been really brilliant about this british library series is because it, it's made a lot of us i think sit up and look at the limitations that are still on us um regardless of your class background you know as, as a woman there is still so much so much more to achieve and still so much more to juggle in the working day yeah it's just a, a, a comment here actually it's finding a room of the RO and compact public school schooling <laughs> well normally <laughs> uh, yes it, it's, a, it's, it's an absolute nightmare if you live in a small house um because even if you can find the space if you have a son that that uh, as mine has been doing goes off and starts playing games the minute you've turned your back you've got to sit there next to you and then you can't concentrate on your own work and you know I do I do various jobs you know I'm not I'm kind of a writer that sits here earning money from writing um I do various things like most women do uh, but homeschooling as well is just it's really not fun it's not fun for the people who are teaching it it's not fun for the children who are sitting there not interacting with their friends um and it is definitely definitely not compatible with being a writer Sue <laughs> so roll on all of this you know getting better for everybody because it's just been such a difficult time and actually we we're getting to the end now but that is one thing i would say you know if there is anybody watching this regardless of your class background regardless of whether you're male or female if you feel that you should be writing right now please don't feel guilty and find a different way of writing and find a different way of coping with it um and and you know even if it's just stuff like blogging or, or messing around on social media writing letters to people who are isolated you know my family do a lot of that um but also explore publishing independently as well and in terms of just taking back the power a little bit for yourself, don't feel that you have to sit there waiting to be discovered. There are, there are all different ways of, if your goal is to write for yourself, fantastic. If your goal is to write for other people, you can still that, do that, but try and be a bit creative about it and, and don't just listen to what everybody else says about, you know, you must have an agent, you must be published by this particular publisher. Take the power back for yourself and start finding out about other people that have done that. Mm -hmm yeah okay brilliant thank you chris i think thank that's you. thanks for all the, the great questions <laughs> okay um so i'd like to just finish on now to um talk about our next writer in residence session which is in two weeks time on thursday the 4th of february and we will be joined by steve ince who writes online uh gaming sto uh, storylines for uh so if you can join us then that'd be absolutely brilliant uh, and also we've got 
Peaky Blinders coming up. Would you like to talk a bit about that, Chris? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That that's another really I mean the Steve, Steve is gonna be fantastic because everybody's into yeah. gaming. And if you if you've got a kid or if you're an adult who loves gaming has got some great ideas and concepts, he's gonna help you to actually make it become reality and to make it into a cracking story that gets noticed. And the Peaky Blinders one is is Carl Chin, <laughs> who was the professor I was talking about before, who is the expert on Peaky Blinders historically who the real Peaky Blinders were and how much of that was translated into the series. So if you're a Peaky Blinders fan or if you know anybody that is, get watching Kirkley's Libraries, look look at our Facebook page and the YouTube channel because um, that's going to be really exciting. We're going to pull apart the facts and the fiction on that one as well. And that's for, uh, <laughs> Thursday the 11th of February 11th. Yeah. at 6.30. Yeah. That's it. That's an evening oh, one. Evening one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so it's time to say goodbye to Thank everybody. You, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for watching. watching all the questions as well. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.